Do you see why I was upset that the clip didn't play last night? We try. Computers are evil. I just want to point that out. But um, happy Valentine's Day. It's great to see you. If you don't have a Valentine of your own, I'll be yours today. Just give me a call. We'll hang out. My uh, sweet, wonderful wife is on the COVID floor today in full COVID gear, which means she won't be able to talk to me either. And uh, so she'll be doing that, probably get home about 9.30, 10 o'clock tonight, just so you know what kind of schedule she has. So thanks for being safe. And the praise team's taking a few extra precautions this week, and we appreciate that too. We especially want to keep David safe, so you can tell all those bad jokes week after week. By the way, your comeback was great there, Brian. That was good. By the way, we pick on each other in love and acceptance, and it's how guys relate. I know it's weird. It's just kind of how we are, right, Dave? Weirdo. All right, so, um, you know, there's times in life that you just have to start over. And if you think about it, I really believe that Moses, because he was told his whole life that he was going to be the deliverer, when he murdered that man, he really felt, okay, God needs me. I'm going to do God's will. I'm going to, God needs my help, and I'm going to do it. And then for the next 40 years, Moses takes off about as far as you can. He goes down the Sinai Peninsula. He is about as far as can be. He marries a foreigner. Probably his father-in-law, um, there's a debate about whether his father-in-law followed Jewish customs. We're guessing no, because the Midianites didn't. And so, uh, um, you know, he's about as far as he can be. 40 years of watching sheep. 40 years with a stick. 40 years of chasing off lions and tigers and bears. Very good. If you haven't been here to church, you'll understand that sometimes I just randomly say things and it's almost like a cult on occasions, but don't be worried. It's not really a cult, despite what your wife used to say, Mike. This is not a cult. So Mike's wife, when she first came here to church, she, she, because we had small groups, she thought, is this like a cult or something? And then she became a Christian. I got to baptize his whole family. So you never know what gets to happen. All right, here's a series verse. Then the Lord said to him, talking about Moses, what's in your hand? And we're going to get here today and talk about this more. A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. And there's a deep theological, there's a lot of theological discussions, and I couldn't believe it as I read different commentaries, how many discussed why Moses ran. And so I'm just going to just summarize it for you. Do you know why he ran? Because there was a snake. I came out my door one morning. This will tell you how long ago it was. It was dark. I was getting my newspaper. Remember newspaper? So I went out in the front yard barefoot, and as I took a step out the door, a snake liked my carpet, and I stepped on a snake. And can I tell you what I did? Not only did I do what Moses did, I ran like this, which is very manly, by the way. If somebody had seen me, I looked like... Uh, I'm not a wooden boy, uh, you know, I don't know. And I scream at a very high pitch. Now, I will tell you that I know this because <clears throat> I've had others in encounters with snakes. And apparently this is some kind of primitive instinct in me that if I scream like a girl, they will run away. Don't know if it's working, but I've not gotten bit yet. So we're just going to stick with that excuse but if you ever are with me and I see a snake, you are, are sworn to confidence that I sounded very manly when I yelled like a girl. So I totally relate to Moses in this. Now, today we're going to talk about this idea of being a humbled hearer. And it takes being humble to hear. See, if you're prideful and you're arrogant, not only can you not hear God, you can't hear other people. If you think you're better than somebody, you can't even hear what they say or what they mean. And on Valentine's Day, listen to me, if you want to hear people in order to love them, you can't think that you are better than them. And you can't assume that what they're saying is ridiculous. You, you have to be humble. And say, can I hear them? There was a medical journal I was reading because I have nothing else to do. We spend a lot of time listening to ourselves talk inside of our heads. We listen to our inner voice each time we read a book, 
Each time we decide what we have for lunch, which some of you are doing right now, or imagine how we're going to get across what we want to say in a meeting. <clears throat> in fact, estimates suggest that we spend a quarter of our waking hours listening to our inner voice. Now, in the Harvard Business Review, it said, research shows that echoing negative thoughts inside of our head increases our chances of depression, it isolates us from others, and inhibits us from pursuing goals. I want you to imagine the voices that Moses heard for 40 years. He was isolated from everyone. He now had to feel rejected by his own people. The man he called Grandpa came after him to kill him. For 40 years, Moses was thinking and focusing on all these things, and yet God had to build it again. I had a similar experience a couple years ago. I was laying flooring in my house, and this is just some extra pieces. That's why they look so bad. But if you don't know anything about this kind of flooring, it just kind of pops together. It's supposed to be very easy as I mess it up, okay, I just broke it. Uh, it's supposed to be very easy to put together, but I was having a really hard time putting this together. And I was struggling. I got about six rows in, and I'm looking at it, and it is not working right. And I've got about 150 feet laid and many more feet to go. And so finally, I called a guy from our church, and I said, hey, hey, I need some help. I, something's going on. This is, and he said, which way did you lay it? I said, what do you mean, which way did I lay it? On the floor. He said, no, 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 if you lay it backwards, if you put the first piece in backwards, it makes every piece hard. I said, you don't understand, I've already laid six rows. He said, well, do you want to lay the rest difficult? I said, no. He said, then you need to start over. So I had to pull up every, the computer just crashed, that's always exciting. I had to pull up every piece of flooring. As I did this, listen, I had had the radio playing. I had had things going. I was singing. I was putting down the floor the wrong way. I was so happy about it, you know. All this happens. I, the radio goes off. I'm frustrated. I start looking at the floor. Man, should I even be doing this? Every negative thought that could cross my mind, cross my mind. Eric, you're such an idiot. How can you not do things right? Should have watched that video more carefully on YouTube, Right? So I called my friend back. I said, listen, can you come help me? I'll be over there tomorrow. So I had to do the hardest thing that you have to do as a man, which is leave a project and wait for somebody. He came back the next day. He helped me start the first row. We got the first row down, second row down. He left, and guess what? Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Just just popped right in. He came back the next day and said, man, you got a lot done. Yeah, it's a lot easier when you do it right. Sometimes God has to get us to a place where we turn down the noise, turn down our own inner dialogue, which is critical. Oh, by the way, there's two kinds of dialogues. One is critical and self-judgmental. The other one Moses had before, which is arrogant and self-centered. Both of those, by the way, are self-centered. Did you know that? We have to turn it down and listen to what God's going to say to us. So today we're going to talk about this. <clears throat> Sorry, I got a little tickle in my throat. We're going to talk about how, and very purpley, we're going to talk very purpley on our screens, how to listen to God. Happy Valentine's Day screens on the side here. If you can't see that from home, it's hilarious. How to listen to God in humility, because here's the deal. We have voices in our heads, words of doubt, words from others that we've heard, fears, some of you are worried about something that's coming up. Sometimes it's pride. Sometimes we fear the future. Sometimes we're worried about our own plans. I want to encourage you today to turn off the noise and realize this. You ready for this one? It's not about you. It's not about you. Moses had to realize that. It's not about you. It's about God. And it's time to listen to God because he has a purpose for you. All right. So number one, how are we going to do that? Number one. We're going to obey his word. I feel like Fred Sanford. All right. Now Moses, remember I told you he was 80. Now Moses, here we pick up the book, was tending the flock 
of Jethro, his father-in-law. This is in Exodus 3, 1 through 7. Oh, Mike, you're so awesome. Everybody give Mike a hand. We appreciate you, Mike. By the way, for those watching, do you, Randy, do you know what temperature it is at your mom's house right now? Negative five degrees. I just want her to know we've turned on the air conditioner in the church building. Nah, 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 nah. No, come visit. Come visit. We love you. Uh, I looked at Kansas City where Jan, my former secretary, lives. Negative one degree this morning. Wind chill factor of you're going to die. <clears throat> now Moses, 80, year old, 80 years old, was tending the flock of Jethro. I love that name because you know I'm thinking about the Beverly Hillbillies every time I read it. His father-in-law, the priest of Midianite, Midian, which sometimes were called Cushites. I don't have time to go into that today, but we'll go into that in a few weeks. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Sometimes that's called Mount Sinai, which you've probably heard of that one. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire and did not burn up, so... Moses thought, I love this, this is such a guy thinking, I will go over and see that strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. By the way, you know why God had to call him twice? Well, listen in the first time. God wasn't repeating himself for effect. Moses probably, you know, is a typical man. Haven't you ever had to do that with some of your husbands and friends? Uh, Eric, uh, Eric, it's not uncommon, by the way. Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. <laughs> do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So a lot of theologians read that part where it says God saw that Moses went over. And what they said is that means that, that the bush had been burning and Moses didn't know it. Now whether it was burning for minutes or hours or days or months, or years, we don't know. But we know that even when Moses was walking towards the bush, God had to say, Moses. Moses. Why? Because all the noise in Moses' head was pushed up. Was, was up. My wife about a year ago bought me these. I don't know if you've got a good set of headphones. This is a good set of headphones, and you put them on, you can't hear a thing. And I crank up my music, and I'm making dinner, and I'm in the kitchen, and I'm minding my own business, and it is cranked up, and I'm listening to whatever's on the radio. I might have some thousand-foot crutch on, you never know. It could be some old Petra. could be some Mylon Lefevre and Broken Heart. That's old school right there. A little rust taff happening. I'm cutting up onions. And one of my kids walks into the kitchen, and they're talking to me, and I'm cutting, 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 and I turn around, and I go, whoop! And they go, I've been talking to you for 10 minutes. And I go, did you not notice that I had my headphones on, and I was dancing? I wasn't dancing to what you were telling me. Now, my kids know anymore they don't come up and tap me either, because that does the same effect as the snake. Right? So they kind of stand at a distance and go like this. And sometimes my kids will say to me, Dad, I've been waving at you for five minutes. And I go, well, I didn't know you were there. I had my headphones on. I was in my own world. Can I tell you something about Moses? He was in his own world. Can I tell you something about you? Too often God is calling to us. He's calling from his word. We're reading the Bible, but we're so busy in our own thinking. You could be sitting in church right now and thinking about something that happened this week, something that happened yesterday, something that happened 20 years ago, or in Moses' case, 40 years ago, and it haunts you. You're worried about the future. You're worried about the past, and God is calling out, Moses, uh, Moses, Eric, Eric, are you going to pay 
attention. The only way you can do that is to turn down the noise and listen to him. Read his word. And here's the deal. We're so often focused on ourselves that we can't hear God because we think God using us is about us. It's not. It's about him. It's not about you. So would you say this with me? It's not about me. Ready? One, two, three. It's not about me. If you were at home and yelled that out, your family's wondering what's wrong with you. This is why I love worship. Because the point of worship is to pull you out of your own thoughts, your own selfish thinking, whether it's positive thinking or negative. Sometimes we think of ourselves too greatly, right? And most of the time we think of ourselves too low. It's to pull us out of that and say, none of that matters. We've got to focus on his power. So the first thing I would encourage you, here's a prayer. God, prepare my heart as I spend time in Scripture. Help me turn down the noise. Help me to listen what you say to me as I spend time in your word. Number two, so we obey his word and then we remember God's presence. Now, this is awesome. I didn't put the verses in here. My mom said I should have. I said, but they're long. Verse seven to nine talks about God says to Moses, hey, I've noticed the Israelites suffering. I've noticed that, that they've been punished, and I've come, God says, I've come to deliver them. And Moses is, listen, he is there on his, with his stick, and these are good plans, God. He says, I'm going to take them to a land of milk and honey. And Moses is like, that sounds great. Way to go. And then we pick up in this verse at the what moment, okay? So get ready for the what? You ever had one of those what moments? Here it comes. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh. You know, the guy who wanted to kill you. You know, the son now. To bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So God tells him all this stuff and says, oh yeah, and you're in charge of this mission. Well, you, you do realize that's my adopted brother. And his dad wanted to kill me. I'm not sure how this is going to go. I mean, Moses has every excuse in the book. So he starts out. But Moses, by the way, one of our problems with our Christianity sometimes is our big butts, right? But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses is saying, it's about me. I can't do that. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you'll worship God on this mountain. So then Moses says to God, and it's really kind of funny, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what will I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. By the way, that's the word Yahweh, so it means I am who I am, I was who I am, and I will be. It's all of those things together. It's a really cool word. This is what you're saying to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Who am I? Now we need to ask that question every day. Who am I? And we need to ask it in two ways. Number one is when you think you're better than everybody, you need to ask who am I to think I'm better than everybody else. And when you think you're worthless and you don't matter, and that your wants and desires and who you are it doesn't really matter, what God wants you to do, you have no abilities, who am I? We need to realize that he is with us. You ever said something to somebody and for days all you could do was think about it, the dumb thing you said? Being an ADD person, uh, do you remember the song on Sesame Street? Manamana. Doo, 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 doo. That's going to be in your head all day. You remember the manana? When I was a kid, five years old, no idea. By the way, I didn't know I had ADD, hyperactivity. I should have known. Till I was in seminary. I was getting a master's degree and ran across it. And I said, that's me. But I remember the little hyper guy that would say, Manamana. He, he would jump out and he couldn't hold himself back. He'd try walking away. And then he just like impulsively came up. I totally related to that guy. Can I tell you, I still relate to that guy. Because he goes, mana, mana, and the girls go, what in the world are you doing? And he's like, mana, mana. 
And they're like, do, 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 do. And he comes out of the side, he jumps up, he comes running back. That's my whole life. So when you're that kind of person sometimes, can I be honest with you? I say things and within three seconds I regret I said them and then don't know how to fix it. And sometimes when I go to fix it, can I tell you I make it worse? You ever done that one? And then sometimes I think, well, maybe I shouldn't say anything. And then somebody says something and I think, well, maybe I should have said something. So for days I play this game in my head, manamana. Did you see the way they looked at me? Doof, 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 right? And if we're not careful, we make ourselves and our foils and our foibles and our mess-ups and our sins the focus. And God says, nay, nay, I will be with you. So thank God. Take a moment to pray this prayer. Thank you for your presence in all that I'm asked to do today. I couldn't fit that whole thing. Number three, last but not least, use the gifts God's given you. You know what this is? It's not just a stick. It's a broomstick. But did you know I can also use this to paint with? This fits on the end of a paint roller. I could come in here, start rolling. Uh, don't let me paint. They know that the, Everybody who's in my small group knows we do not let Eric have brushes or rollers. He makes more of a mess than it's worth. Right, Robert? Robert's like, yes, I'm with you on that one. But it's just a stick. There's nothing to it. What has God given you that's your gift? Your talent that feels like nothing? Are you going to let him have it? See, too often we're busy looking at what other people have. And we say, well, God, if I had that, then I could do something for you. Moses had to think, if I wasn't just a shepherd, then I could do something for you. God, if I wasn't just a plumber, I could do something for you. God, if I wasn't just a car repair man... I could do something for you. God, if I was smarter or better or had this skill or could do that or could pray better or could, what? It's your excuse. And God says, that's not what it's about. Moses answered, what if they don't believe me? By the way, God just told him they would. And say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A stick. A staff. He replied, the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. It became a snake and he ran from it. We already talked about that. Then the Lord said to him, this is my favorite part, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took a hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. Let me tell you what Moses did at this point for the first time. He listened to God. You don't hear Moses argue. You don't hear Moses complain. I don't know about you, but if God asked me to pick up a snake, I might have a few objections. Poisonous or not, you know. But what does Moses do? God says, pick up the snake. And you know what Moses did? He took his first big step of faith. Listen, whenever God calls you, whether it's to visit a neighbor, whether it's to bring soup to somebody, whether it's to call somebody that you haven't talked to in forever, whether it's to call somebody who you think, well, they're supposed to call me today, and now you haven't talked in five years. Hey, hey, when you go to do that, it's terrifying anytime you step out in faith. Maybe you're at lunch with a friend, and you say to them, are you a Christian? Do you go to church anywhere? Those are terrifying steps. I mean, you're grabbing the end of a snake. Who knows where they're coming, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen. Or are you one of them religious freaks? Maybe. Or just maybe that's what God will use, that conversation, those thoughts, those things that you say. So Moses reached out, took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. Moses had to be like, oh, okay, that went a lot better than I thought. By the way, you know when you grab a snake's tail, they can still bite you, right? It's not like an alligator, you Floridians. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. You know what God was also letting Moses know there? You're part of my family too. No matter how far you've run, no matter what you've done, no matter how many times you've failed, no matter whether you've done something terrible, 
the God of the New Testament who welcomes home the prodigal son is the God of the Old Testament that knew that he could use a murderer to write the first five books of the Bible. This is the God you serve. Quit being so hard and religious and looking at what you think you can accomplish because it's not about you. God, I'm just going to be obedient to you. God, I'm just going to do the conver- the, have the conversation you want me to have. God, I'm just going to take the steps you want me to have. God, I'm going to spend time in your word and listen to you. God has given you gifts and a purpose. And let me tell you something that's exciting for me. You know what's exciting for me right now in our church? As we've gone through COVID, we have a lot of people who can't come back and serve, which is okay. We've just started to have people step up who've never stepped up and say, you know what? I'm willing to lead a greeting team. You know what? I'm willing to help in children's ministry. You know what? I'm willing to help up there in the booth. And you know what that tells me? That people are starting to say, God gave me a stick. How do you want me to use it, God? And I believe as a church, when we get to the point that we all start to say, God, what do you want me to do? And then we do it. God will multiply this congregation. Not only that, he'll multiply the people who make it into heaven when you're faithful with what God's given you. And as soon as you say, but, you're just being like Moses. Put your big butt away and ask God what he wants you to do and do it. And if you're faithful to that, God will use you, even if all you have is a stick. So ask him to use you today. The final thing I want you to pray is, God or Lord, give me confidence in you and your gifts in me. If you're not using the gifts God's given you, guess what? You're just like Moses at the beginning. But if you start reaching out, it's terrifying to reach out and use your gifts. But use them. Sign up. Go out of your way. Meet somebody for breakfast. Call somebody on the phone. Text somebody you miss. Go out of your way to say, God, what do you want me to do? And then do it. If you're here today or you're watching online, you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. You can surrender your life to him. You've got to turn down the noise of the world and say, God, I want to hear you. But if you're here today and you want to give your life to him, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian after the service. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again on a cross, why? Died on a cross and rose again, why? Because we're sinners, we're messed up. And when you say, Jesus, I need you in my life, I surrender my life to you, Please forgive me of my sins. And when we trust in him, the Bible says the great exchange takes place. He gives you his righteousness for your sin. He gives you his Holy Spirit for all your junk to help you to walk in the Christian life. If you're here watching online, you can do that today. If you're here as a Christian, I just want to challenge you. Hey, I know it's terrifying to be faithful. Reach out and take that first step. And once you take that first step, guess what? It's not as bad as you thought it was. Just do what God's called you to do. Be faithful in it, and he'll use you. He'll change the people in your life and the world. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for these moments. We thank you for each one you've given us. Lord, we thank you for the people you've put in our lives that have used their gifts so that we're even here today. Father, we thank you for a story about a man who messed up so badly that, Father, we look at him and we say, well, at least I haven't messed up that bad, and yet you restored him. You rebuilt from the beginning, and use Moses to change the world. Lord, use us. Use the gifts we have. May we be faithful with what you've given us. And Lord, as we take steps of faith, that you would fill us with joy and peace in your presence. For that one today struggling in their own thoughts, and their own fears, and their own depression and discouragement, maybe they're thinking about what they don't have today. Lord, that right now, you would let them know they have you. And that's all that we need. So, Father, restore to us what the enemy's torn down. Help us to rebuild what you want us to. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.